Um, but this morning we're going to continue in our series in the book of Mark. And we have been in chapter 12, and there's been a series of three questions that uh, the leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, that they're bringing to Jesus. And the first of those is the political question, right? Should we pay our taxes uh, to Caesar? And the second of the questions is about, um, more about religion. You see, there's this law called the Leveret Law, and it had to do with uh, what happened in the case of um, a, a spouse dying, and then the brother would marry the spouse, and, and there was this hubbub about, well, what happens if, if this goes on seven times? In the resurrection, who's, who's going to be married to who? So it's the religious question. We're going to skip that question. Um, I'm not really sure why, but it, it wasn't assigned to me today. So praise God. I thought Seth might give that one to me as he went on vacation, but he was gracious to me. Uh, the, the third question is, is a, a question about what is the greatest commandment? Uh, so uh, certainly a question that I am very glad that I do not have to come up with my ideas or opinions on because there's plenty of laws, plenty of commandments, plenty of things that I could sift through and, and uh, give my ideas about. But that is not why we're here this morning, and therefore uh, you can be glad, because that would be a laborious effort. Uh, we know through the book of Mark that the teachers are trying to trick Jesus. They are not coming in an honest manner to learn the truth from Jesus, but rather they are coming trying to trap him and trying to trick him. These guys have been evaluating and judging Jesus' every move and word and action since he started his ministry. So much that they were judging in the beginning of Mark the way that he and his disciples were washing their hands. That they were judging who Jesus was eating with. This is their heart and their motive. To trick and to trap Jesus into doing something or saying something that they, they could use against him. And so with that heart they come this morning, we read about them asking this third and final question in the series of three. Let's pray as we begin. God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in and through this precious word. God, this, this passage is familiar. This passage is one that we've heard, one that we've read. It's so familiar to us. And it's easy to just glance over. God, would you grip us? Would you get us this morning? Would you open the depths of our hearts and the depths of our minds that we might truly see you for who you are in your glory and in your greatness and in your power and in your might? And would we yield our hearts and our minds to you? For you are good. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12. We'll read verses 28 through 34 make some observations. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing among one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, the scribe asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, well, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no one other besides him. And to love him with all of the heart and with all of the understanding and all of the strength and to love one neighbor as oneself is much more than the whole of burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that the scribe answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. It was the mic drop moment. No one dared to ask any more questions. 
So the scribe comes, and, and he's trying to stir the pot. He's trying to get things fired up a little bit, and he asks Jesus this question, and he gets much more of an answer than he was expecting because he doesn't just get the answer to his question. He actually gets a judgment based on that command or that law that Jesus elevates as being the highest. That's not exactly what he wanted, certainly not in the public setting, but that's exactly what he got. And we find ourselves today with this text reading about how this scribe or a lawyer of the time, a lawyer, not just a lawyer, but a theologian, how this theologian was examining Jesus by asking him, which is the greatest? Out of 613 commands, out of everything that God has said, out of everything that God has spoken, what is the greatest? It's not an uncommon sentiment in the New Testament that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We actually find in Luke 10 that Jesus, when approached by another lawyer who says, how can I inherit eternal life? Jesus turns the question back to him and says, well, how do you read it? How do you read the scripture? And this lawyer, the scribe, says, well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew 22, we have the same dialogue recorded that we have here in Mark 12. In Matthew 7, we have Jesus again saying that uh, the, the golden rule, which we all are very familiar with, is that we should do to other people what we have or would have them do to us. Romans 13, Paul weighs in on the matter, and he says that we really should owe nothing to anyone except love. And this is the full expression of the law and the prophets, of the law. It's the full expression of the law. So not only is this a, not an uncommon sentiment, it's not an uncommon debate. The, the teachers of the law would love to sit around a table and debate about what's the greatest, which law outdid the other laws, and which laws, therefore, are more important in your lives to follow. Some would argue that honoring your father and mother was the greatest law. And some argued that uh, respecting a mother bird was the least of the laws. Maybe we can agree on that this morning. Nothing against mother birds. But the reality is that this was a very common debate among the time. But we know that this scribe's motive is to stir the pot. And so here we have these, these leaders, and we have this crowd that's listening in, and we already have kind of elevated tensions because we've gotten political and we've gotten religious, and what two things are you never supposed to talk about at the family meal? Politics and religion. And so this guy sees the perfect chance to just dump a little bit of gas on the fire and maybe sit back and watch. Have you ever been tempted to do that? at the Thanksgiving table, just kind of toss something into the middle, and then just kind of sit back and watch the fireworks. So he asks this question, forcing Jesus to not only elevate one law over the others, but thereby diminish law that had been spoken. This is a very human thing for us to do, is it not? We love to talk about what is the greatest. What's the greatest football team? You ask that in the wrong crowd and you've lost the entire day. What is the greatest uh, phone operating system? We all know that Apple rises to the top. Amen? See, we could, we could get things going right here. We all love to ask that question, what is the greatest? And when we ask that question, we're debating on, on, on metrics that, that we uh, hold on to. Uh, the, the number of all-star games won. What's the greatest basketball player? It's Michael Jordan. Well, why is it Michael Jordan? Because of the number of points he scored or the all-star games that he's won. Right? We, we have these metrics that we use to judge in our world, in our realm, in our reality, who is the greatest. But here's the problem. That can change tomorrow. Right? Our finite understanding of greatest changes tomorrow. The greatest cup of coffee, if you watch the movie of Elf, was found in a little coffee shop in downtown New York. 
Well, now we know it's Micah's. And so the, the concept of, of the greatest in our understanding, in our way of thinking, can change. But that's, we, that's not, what's, it's not what Jesus is saying. We can't approach this text with that finite understanding, even though that's probably how the scribe was walking into this discussion. To understand the grandeur, the splendor, to understand the nature of Jesus' answer here, it is important that we understand what it truly means to be the greatest in this context. To be the greatest or to be the most important of all is to be above all and before all and over all, to be the first place for all of time to be the first in matter of importance, the first in matter of influence, the first in matter of rank for all of eternity. See, there's no new information that can arrive tomorrow in Jesus' vantage point, in Jesus' perspective. And therefore, the way that Jesus answers this question is much different than the way we sit around and debate about what is or isn't the greatest. Jesus makes this declaration from an eternal perspective, an eternal positioning, and it doesn't matter the cultural understanding or the cultural nuances or the cultural sensitivities that arise and change what a good law is and what a good law isn't. You see, Jesus is uniquely qualified to answer the question. Jesus is uniquely qualified to answer this question from the scribe because he is able to survey all of eternity. He is able to see from the very beginning of time to the very end of eternity if there was such a thing. And he is able to, to survey everything that God says and everything that, that comes out of the heart and the mind of God. And he is able to look at all of history and say, well, this is the single most important of all. So Jesus does this, just that. He surveys the greatest book of all times that was given to us by God himself it's the greatest of all times in terms of predictions and accurate outcomes, 100%. It's the greatest of all times in terms of original content to modern day translation. It's the greatest of all times in terms of enduring persecution and, and uh, people seeking to eliminate its existence. It's the greatest of all times in terms of a number of early manuscripts. It's the greatest of all times in terms of its author and its position and its truth and its authority, I wouldn't dare to open the word and claim that I could boil all of that greatness down to one law or command. But Jesus is qualified to take a survey of the greatest book of all times. So that's, that's where we find ourselves today, church is listening into this conversation. You've heard it a thousand times. But it's the greatest law of all times. So don't just glance over it. Don't just gloss over it. Don't just skim this part of, of the book because you know it. Do you? Has it changed the way you live? Has it changed the way you think? It's the greatest commandment of all of eternity. I think we should give it a little bit of thought. So Jesus surveys all of eternity, all of history. He surveys the greatest book of all times. And he narrow, narrows it down. What, is it all, what does it all flow out of? What does it all depend on? 
what does it all boil down to? What's the essence that we can hold on to? Verse 29, Jesus is going to answer the question. Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this. It's a bonus command. The scribe didn't even ask for that. He gets two. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than no other commandments are greater than these. Yesterday, today, or tomorrow. These commandments are foremost in time and place, in order of importance and influence and rank. They're the chief commandments. And in this account in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus, uh, or Matthew records Jesus saying this of these two commandments. On these two commandments, love God, love neighbor. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Or you could say, on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. So if you take two nails and you put them in a wall, everything else hangs from those two nails. Everything else flows from, from these two realities. Everything else comes from love God, love neighbor. And if those two things fail, if they crumble, if they fall, if they're removed, everything else falls. In other words, they're the greatest. The rest of it hangs on to those truths. Jesus answers the question by lifting two commands out of Scripture. So he takes these two concepts, love God and love neighbor. He takes them from the Old Testament. One is from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk in the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God is reviewing all of the good things that he has given, all of the good commands that he's given, and he says, hey, I want you to teach them to your kids. I want you to talk about them. See, when you love God, it, it, it comes out of you. And he says, I want you to talk about this, and I want you to talk about it when you're, when you're walking, and when you're sitting, and when you're lying, and when you rise up. He covers pretty much everything we can possibly be doing. This should consume you. Think about it. This passage from Deuteronomy is called the Shema, and it, it, it means here. Here. But the Hebrew understanding of here isn't just that you would take it in. There is no Hebrew word merely for taking it into your ears. It just doesn't exist. That's an American concept. Here is to, to have what enters into your being permeate who you are and, and change what you do. That's what it means to hear. Danny says, hear it in here, and then let it come out here. So let it change you. So what's the first thing that God says when he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There is one God, there is one authority, there is one power, there is one source, there is one creator, and it naturally follows then that we should give our one life to that one being. 
to the one who is above all and over all. We should give our minds, we should give our, our emotions, we should give our heart, we should give everything that we are to this one being. It's actually quite phenomenal that God wants us. Isn't it? Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, God wants you. And he wants all of you. He wants every ounce and every thought and every fiber of your being, and he wants you to pursue him. He says, love the Lord your God. Love is, is not this mushy, gushy, I love pizza. I do love pizza. But love here is, is an act of will rather than emotion or above emotion. It's a dedication. It's an allegiance. It's a, a, a faithfulness and a loyalty. It's a decision of your being. Love the Lord your God with all of, with the totality of who you are, with the completeness of who you are. With, with, with all of your heart and all of your emotions and all of your affections and, and all of your uh, understanding and all of your thinking and all of everything. With your body and with your strength and, and with, the, with the muscles and with your actions and your gifts and your skills, would, would, would all of that be faithfully committed to God? So what's the most important command? Well, it how we relate with the one creator, the one being, the one supreme God. How do we relate with him? What is our relationship with God? Well, it should be to, to get into his presence and to sit at his feet and to seek him and to faithfully pursue and follow him. So the question is, are you single-minded? In your, in your daily life, are you single-minded? Does God have your heart? Does God have your mind? Jesus goes on. And he says the second commandment is this. Now then he lifts a passage right up out of Leviticus. And I love that. Because if you're honest with yourself, you have probably kind of demoted Leviticus. Okay, I think this is on purpose. God hid this nugget in there, and he says this book is just as important. In fact, greatest command right out, of, right out of Leviticus. And he says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I imagine a, a gavel when he says it, because that would be cool. Context for Leviticus 19. All of these laws... Imagine this. They relate to how we treat other people. It says you should share with a foreigner. You should have compassion. You should operate with absolute honesty and justice in your relationships. You should show impartiality. You should refuse to gossip and slander. You should not have malice or rage or anger towards other people. You should refuse to bear a grudge or hold a grudge against someone. You know, I look at this list of things, I'm like, that's how I want you to treat me. I don't want you to hold a grudge against me. Like, even if I make a mistake, I want you to be quick to forgive me. I want you to not slander or gossip about me. I want you to be honest in our relationship. That's how I want you to treat me. It's true. That's how I want you to treat me. John Piper looks at this concept and he explains it this way. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, I want to imagine, I want you to imagine yourself. Just close your eyes and, and pick, you don't have to, well, you can. Close your eyes and picture yourself. And I want you to rip the skin off your and I want you to take that skin and I want you to wrap it around the person that's in front of you. 
See, when, when, when you remove the skin off your body, when you put that skin on the person in front of you, and you open your eyes and you look at that person, who are you looking at? You're, you're looking at you and all of those desires and all of those things that, that you wanted in your life. Not now, now your goal and your pursuit is to, to help fulfill those things in, in the life of the person in front of you. And suddenly, instead of being so self-consumed, I, that, 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 that consumption is, is bent outwards, and I want to love you, and I want to serve you, and I want to help uh, make these things a reality in your life. Because when I look at you, I'm seeing myself. You have my skin on. See, and now it begins to hit home. The whole love, your neighbor as yourself piece, that begins to get a little bit more convicting perhaps. Our, our, our relationship with God at some level is invisible. But it becomes visible. How we love God becomes very visible in how we treat other people. So how much we love this way and the relationship that we have this way visible when we look at those and we interact with those around us and Luke in the gospel of Luke chapter 10 Jesus is having this conversation with this lawyer and the lawyer seeking to justify himself says well you know all of this is well and good this sounds great this is a great way to treat some other people well, who's my neighbor? Like, really, Jesus, who are you actually expecting me to love as myself? And you know the story that Jesus tells. It's the Good Samaritan. And we know this guy's on a journey. He's out walking, and he's going between Jerusalem and Jericho. Uh, a, a gang, a bunch of robbers come up. They thrash the guy. They take his clothes. They take everything he has, and they leave him alongside the road for dead. The Levite passes, the priest passes by, they notice the guy, and they move to the other side of the road. Then a Samaritan comes, and this is what it says of the Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he had had compassion. There was something that rose up within him that he had to take action. He couldn't ignore it. He had to do something. And you can all understand this. The word for compassion literally means to have the bowels yearn. We've all been there. I was hiking the other day. I was hiking the other day and just enjoying the beauty. And then, then it hit me. And you see, it's in that moment when the bowels yearn that nothing else matters. <laughs> nothing else matters in that moment. That's compassion, church. <laughs> that something rises up within you that you have to deal with. <laughs> compassion. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He had to take action. Nothing else mattered to him in that moment. When he looked at the man in the ditch, he sees himself. He says, if that was me, if that was me, I would want somebody to help me. You know what it sounds like? It sounds a lot like Jesus. Jesus saw the crowds, and he was moved with What? compassion, and he healed their sick. Jesus uh, saw that the crowds hadn't eaten for three days, and he was moved by what? 
compassion, and he fed them. He saw the blind men beside the road, and he was moved with compassion, church, and he touched their eyes, and he healed them. He saw the woman grieving because her son had died. Jesus looks at this lawyer and he says, well, which, which one of these three guys, the priest, the Levite, sounds like a joke, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which one was the neighbor? We know it was the Samaritan because he had mercy and compassion. So who is your neighbor, church? The, the person beside you, the person in front of you, the person across from you, the person that cuts you off when you're late to work, the coworker that frustrates you, the boss that is unfair to you. When you look at the lives of those around you, are you moved with compassion for them? Are you moved with compassion, church? The greatest command of all time is that we, would, that we would pursue God with our whole heart and with our whole mind and, and our whole body. And, and do you realize that when we do that, when we get wrapped up in God and when we lose ourselves in pursuit of God and when we come to Him with all of who we are and that we're in this intimate and this personal relationship and we're connected with God and we're caught up in His love, that love changes the way we see the people around us. And, and when, when, when we begin to see those people as hurting and broken and needy, then we're, we're stirred to take action because we have compassion for them. Are you moved with compassion? Does the love of God work in you and through you and change you that, and, 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 that, that you see the needs? Or are we just these these balls of, of self-desire, would we begin to serve the person in front of us with the same fervor and passion that we try to meet our own needs? Where the love of God is bent outward through us. Without these two laws, Without these two commandments, everything else crumbles. It falls. It fails. The worship team can come back up. The answer that Jesus gives in this passage, it settles well with the scribe. And the scribe has the nerve to agree with Jesus at a certain level. The scribe said in verse 32, You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is, you've truly said that he is one and that there is no other beside him and to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and strength to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. See, this, this, this scribe adds his own commentary to the matter. He adds his own two cents worth. Jesus says, that's great, you're wise. But then Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. What's the, what's the kingdom of God got to do with any of this, Jesus? I just ask you what the, the highest law is. You see... The kingdom of God is, is, is where the rule and the reign of God is. The kingdom of God is the place where, where his love permeates. The kingdom of God is where love rules. And, and it doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter how much you do. If you're not wrapped up in and lost in and consumed by and, and pursuing the love of God, then everything much as you want to know, but without love, without love, the citizens of God's kingdom are marked by love, church. All of eternity 
is created from love. And God is inviting us into that relationship with Him so that He can love the world through us. But do you realize that for this to be a reality for me, something heavenly has to happen to me. This isn't something that we just do. It's something that we have to become with the power of a living God at work inside of us. Our love of God is ultimately invisible outside of how we love and serve those around us, church. Do you have that compassion rising up within you when you see the needs and the desires of those around you? For that to be true of your life, for that to be true in my life, we've got to have Jesus. We've got to have his power in us. If you want to be stirred with compassion, you got to give your life to God wholly and completely with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your 